King of the Harem Heaven, Chapter 4 Gentlemen of the jury, Assistant Prosecutor Oscar M. Springer opened for the state of Michigan. The defendant in this case is charged with a serious crime. The offense of carnally knowing a girl between the ages of 14 and 16 years. The alleged offense was committed in the city of Detroit, February last, upon the person of Bernice Bickle, a little girl, a mere child. Bernice, as you will see, is a beautiful girl. We shall establish that Prince Michael Mills first met her when she was playing the piano and singing at a revival meeting held in her uncle's home in Sarnia. And when the long-haired, bearded prince first beheld her girlish figure and her ruby lips and her big blue eyes, we shall prove his lustful and lascivious nature was aroused and he at once began to plan to catch his prey. Watching the young state's attorney at work, Ben Purnell relaxed confidently in his seat. The last stage of his dethronement plot against the Israelite ruler was in good hands. Newspapers had mentioned this would be Springer's first really big case. Certainly his first against an adversary as formidable as the famous Colonel John Atkinson, and even now, Prosecutor Samuel W. Burroughs was sitting in, shepherding the strategy, ready to help the moment he was needed. Oscar Springer went on to point out that, from the beginning, it had been Prince Michael who'd forced the acquaintance. That Bernice, according to her own sworn statement, considered him a fraud and funny-looking old man. Springer mentioned letters Mills had written to Bernice and her parents, money he'd sent in an attempt to bribe her to come to Detroit. He cited the mention of the Bickle girl in practically all of the prince's business correspondence at the time, concluding that he obviously had Bernice on the brain. He went on with a detailed description of the various means of persuasion that had led to the actual seduction. He told her he had to sow seed in her body for the purpose of casting out evil. She refused. He asked if she was willing to obey him. No, she wept, not like that. He jumped up in a rage and shouted that the Lord would have a willing people. The next night he quoted the Bible to her by the hour, along with this flying roll book of his. He told her he was pure, and that to the pure all things were pure. He asked her then if she was not a little tease and pulled up her nightgown. She jerked it back down. A man of 35, he kept this up until this child of 15 could fight him off no longer. Naturally, for a girl of such tender years, intercourse was painful. When she flinched and cried, he ordered her to hold still and told her that once her seal was broken, intercourse would be a pleasure. Afterwards, she sobbed that she was bleeding. And what did the illustrious prince say to this? Praise God, he lectured her, for without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Why do I dwell on this point? Because, gentlemen of the jury, it is proof positive from the man's own lips that Bernice Bickle was a pure and chaste girl before she fell into this villainous clutches. Scientists tell us that we do not get more than half of the heat producing properties from wood and coal. The other half is lost in ashes or goes off in gases and smoke. So it is with the prosecution of criminals. A great many of them escape by means of legal technicalities. There is not a lawyer in the entire state of Michigan able to discern a legal fly spec quicker than the learned counsel for the defendant, the famed Colonel Atkinson. And so I must ask you, gentlemen of the jury, to be careful, to pay strict attention to the evidence as it comes in, and pay attention only to the evidence. Thank you. He turned to the bench where Circuit Judge Edward D. Kinney presided. The people called Bernice Bickle. As Ben Purnell watched the girl nervously take the stand and give a timid voice response to the oath, he saw quite obviously what had prompted Prince Mike. Bernice's lips weren't ruby, as Springer had insisted. They were in fact near white and drawn very thin now. But her eyes were certainly big and blue, and her figure was far more than girlish. How old are you, Bernice? The assistant prosecutor asked pleasantly. Fifteen, her voice was low. When did you first meet the defendant, Michael Mills? Last November. Where did you meet him? At my uncle's house. I read you the opening line of a letter and ask if you can identify it. 
You are commanded by the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to come and place yourself in obedience to Michael, his son. He wrote that to me. Did he also write letters to your parents? Yes. Were your parents followers of Michael Mills? They were Israelites. He was the prince. They showed me in my Bible where a great prince named Michael would stand up for the children of Israel and deliver them from trouble. That's in the 12th chapter of the book of Daniel, isn't it? I don't remember. Did your parents then bring you to Detroit? They sold our house and moved there. And you continued to live with them? No, they found a house to rent and sent me to live at Prince Michael's house. In the house at 37 Hamlin Avenue? Yes, he said I had to come and be the tenth piece in the Godhead. I see. And how many pieces did the illustrious prince have living with him at the time? Objection! Colonel Atkinson rose to his feet in righteous anger. The term is Prince Michael's, not mine, but I'll withdraw it, Oscar Springer shrugged. Who else was there, Bernice? Well, there was Mrs. Mills and Eliza Court. The young girl counted on her fingers as she tried to remember. And Mae Webster, and Mary Ellen Rowlandson, and Carrie Bendry, and Emma Butler, and Alice Court. That's all, I guess. How many beds were in that house? Four. Just four? Each in a separate room? Yes. Where did you sleep the first night? With Mrs. Mills and May Webster. That was the 21st of December, was it not? Yes. And the next night? I slept with Mary Ellen Rowlandson. And the night after that? They sent me to Prince Michael's room. Was he there? Not at first. I went to bed early. Then he came in and sat down on the side of the bed. What did he say to you? He talked about music and different things like that. What did he do after that? He got undressed and got into bed. Did he say anything about Satan at that time? Objection! Colonel Atkinson boomed again. Counsel is leading the witness. Overruled, Judge Kinney decided. Did he say anything about Satan, Bernice? The assistant prosecutor repeated. He said that Satan sowed tares, but the Son of Man sowed the good seed. The Son of Man? He said he was the Son of Man and had been cleansed by the fire coming out of his hands and out of his hair. What did you say in answer to him? I said no. Why did you say no? Objection! Colonel Atkinson was on his feet once more. Counsel is calling for conclusion on the part of the witness. Overruled, the judge told him. May I have an exception, Your Honor? You have an appropriate exception. Now, Bernice, Oscar Springer went on. Why did you say no? Because I didn't understand it at all, and I didn't want him to. When you refused to submit to him, what did he say to you? Did he say anything about obedience? Another objection was overruled. Yes, he said I had to obey him in everything. When was the next time you were sent to his room? I think it was about three weeks after that. Did he quote the Bible to you extensively at that time? Did he read to you from a book called The Flying Roll? Yes. And did you submit to his desires? No, I wouldn't do it. When was the next time you were ordered to sleep in Michael's room? The 21st of February, I think. The 21st of February. You slept with Mills that night? Yes, and with Eliza Court too. The three of you? Who slept in the middle? Objection, Colonel Atkinson shouted but not before Bernice had mumbled. He did. What did the bearded prince say to you at that time? He said I was evil because I had been sleeping with Mrs. Mills and she was evil, and I'd caught it from her. He said I would have to sleep with him and Sister Eliza to get pure like they were. But after a while, Sister Eliza got up and left. And what did Prince Michael say to you when Eliza Court was gone? He said that by obedience, Israel would be cleansed. He said that was the only way to be pure like him. He said he was as pure as Jesus was. And did the defendant in fact have carnal intercourse with you that night? I told him no. The girl was starting to cry a little. I told him not to. Just a few more questions, Bernice, the young state attorney assured her. Prior to that night, were you a chaste girl? Yes. Had you ever had intercourse with anyone previously? Springer repeated himself to establish the point firmly. No. 
Did the defendant himself say to you that you could always tell a virgin by the seal and that your seal had never been broken? Yes. Did you call out for help when he hurt you? I was afraid to. I was afraid he'd kill me. He said I had to choose what I wanted, life or death. He said the Lord would have only a willing people and all others would be burned alive. And he had carnal intercourse with you again after that? Yes. And you were taken into protective custody by the police on March 28th and have been living at the Woodbridge Station since that time? Yes. I now show you two written statements and ask if these are your own statements, made of your own free will and signed without the offering of any inducements. Yes, they are. Your Honor, I offer these in evidence as People's Exhibit A and B. No more questions. Colonel John Atkinson rose and studied the two exhibits for a long time while the girl waited fearfully in the witness chair. From his seat in the second row, Ben Purnell watched the chief defense attorney carefully. He'd seen this famous criminal lawyer several times before. He even talked to him briefly on offering himself as a character witness. The colonel was a very shrewd man. Ben had realized then. The colonel had sensed instantly that this red-headed, overly sincere character couldn't be trusted, and he declined the offer. Who asked you to make this last statement, Bernice? Atkinson's voice was gentle and disarming. I told the other girls about it. They say I better write it down. I wrote it myself. Now, Bernice, didn't you still sign another statement before either of these was made? Another one. Oh, yes. Your Honor, the Colonel turned to the bench. I demand that the prosecution produce that earlier statement. Oscar Springer rose to his feet. We're quite willing to do so, Your Honor even to offer it into evidence, with, of course, the privilege of examining this witness on his contents. He handed over a sheet of paper to be marked People's Exhibit C. Colonel Atkinson took his time reading it. Did you write this, Bernice? He finally asked softly. Yes. Did you sign it? So it seems you changed your story entirely while being held at Woodbridge Station. Originally, you swore there had been nothing wrong between you and the defendant. Prince Michael told me to. He said an oath didn't mean anything because he was like a Catholic priest and he could make it all right with God. Your witness. All at once, the colonel turned and went back to the defendant's table. This was an abrupt shock to the young state's attorney, to the jury, to the entire crowded courtroom. Ben Purnell edged forward on his seat in surprise. For the great Colonel Atkinson to drop his examination on such an unfavorable note after making little attempt to shake the girl's story seemed incredible. Something tricky was shaping up here. Oscar Springer cautiously began his redirect questioning on the subject of Bernice's earlier statement. Bernice, you told the Colonel that when I first talked to you at police headquarters, you denied there was anything wrong because Prince Michael told you to because he said he could make it all right with God for you to lie. Was there any reason why you denied having intimate relations with him? He said he'd put the handcuffs on me and lock me up like he did Mrs. Mills one time. I see. Now the colonel has insinuated that someone told you to make your statements. Did anyone since you've been confined in Woodbridge Station ever ask you to make a statement that was not true in every sense of the word? No. Thank you. No more questions. Just one moment, young lady, Colonel John Atkinson rose suddenly and moved quickly to the witness chair, stopping Bernice as she started to leave. His voice had changed completely. It now had the same crisp deadliness as the crack of a whip. You haven't mentioned, and the state's attorney has repeated, that Prince Michael's considered his office to be something like that of a Catholic priest. Did you by any chance make confession in the Israelite colony the way the Catholics do? Yes, the girl admitted puzzled now. As a matter of fact, you have to write all an accounting of all your sins before you can join the colony, don't you? Bernice could only nod. Please speak up, young lady, Judge Kinney prompted her. Yes, her voice trembled. Now, Bernice, when you confessed your sins upon first entering the colony, didn't you admit doing what you called bad things with two different male persons? The girl couldn't answer. She looked trapped and helpless. 
Didn't you admit having connections with two different male persons before ever coming to Detroit? Sobbing hysterically now, the girl finally choked out an admission. So you lied to us! The colonel snapped at her, and she winced at every word. So you weren't really chased when you came to the colony? I don't know, Bernice cried. I don't know. Your Honor, Assistant Prosecutor Springer rushed up to the bench. If any so-called confession exists in writing, as counsel claims, let him produce it and let it be admitted in evidence. This is the cheapest sort of courtroom trick I've ever seen. After what this girl has endured at the hands of that... Your Honor, Colonel Atkinson protested, other names than that of this witness are involved in that confession, and I might add, other sins, none of which have any bearing on this case. I have established the only pertinent point through examination of this witness. Judge Kinney motioned them both to the bench, where they argued the point out of hearing of the jury and the audience. Ben Purnell sat stunned by this new development. He'd known of the written confessions that were required for admission to the colony, of course. He'd written one out himself, filling it with vague, meaningless generalities. But the Colonel's unrefuted suggestions about what the Bickles girl's confession had contained were simply impossible. Whispers about the blood on the sheets in God House that morning had circulated through the new and latter house of Israel. Ben had never fully realized before that the girl's chastity, or lack of it, had any particular bearing on the law under which Mike Mills was being tried. But now, remembering how the state's attorney had stressed the point in opening, he realized this was extremely important. Judge Kinney finally made his ruling. The defense would not be required to produce the alleged confession. The prosecution could probe its contents by examination of the witness. Bernice was still crying, and Oscar Springer did his best to calm her as he began the difficult task. Why did you write this so-called confession which the colonel is so afraid to produce, Bernice? Did you write it of your own free will? No, the girl sobbed. Sister Eliza made me do it. I see. How long ago was it and when the bad things in this alleged confession were done? I don't remember. The girl was back on the brink of hysteria. Wasn't it a number of years ago, Bernice? I guess so. Can you remember how many years ago, Bernice? No, she choked. But you must have been just a little girl then. You hardly more than a mere child right now. These male persons the colonel talked about, weren't they just little boys? Bernice nodded, but her answer was inaudible. She was breaking down completely now, coming apart inside, choking and shuddering as she cried. Now tell us what you did with the little boys, Bernice. Springer urged her, fighting hard to get out a few more precious answers before she collapsed. Don't be afraid. Weren't the little boys just fooling around with you? I don't know, she gasped. I don't know what you mean. Was, was there any penetration of you by the little boys? The assistant prosecutor prodded her desperately. Her voice entirely out of control, Bernice shook her head, then nodded, then twisted her head about meaningless and Oscar Springer was forced to give up. All right, Bernice, he soothed her. All right, it's all over now. He turned to the bench. No more questions, Your Honor. I think we've made sufficient progress for today. Judge Kinney had a pained expression on his face as he adjourned the court. Benjamin Franklin Purnell was deeply worried. His dethronement plot was in serious trouble. If the girl's chastity was a crucial point of law, and the state's attorney was able to do no more to erase the doubts Colonel Atkinson had planted, Prince Mike might very well walk out of the courthouse a free man as a result of a directed verdict of not guilty. The more he thought about Bernice Bickle and her alleged written confession, the more Ben was sure the defense lawyer was shrewdly misreading it. Where would that confession be now? In the Colonel's possession? Probably not. Atkinson wouldn't be carrying it about or leaving it in his Detroit office and risking a charge of suppressing evidence. Would the Prince or Eliza Court be carrying it? Once again, probably not. The chance of losing it would be too great. No, Bernice's confession was most certainly secreted away in some remote corner of God House. If he had to stay up the entire night searching, Ben Purnell promised himself he was going to find it. <laughs>